Hi right, guys, welcome back to Mad Chef. This is episode number 434, pe featuring the uh, third installment, I believe. <laughs> or is it the fourth? Uh, anyway, the next installment of my interview with uh, Mr. George Zeitz. This part of the interview, we pick up where we left off, talking about Mask of the Betrayer. Uh, we talk a bit about Planescape Torment. We get into uh, Dungeon Siege 3, what happened there. And we just start to get into uh, Torment Tides of Numenera uh, towards the end of the video. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here if you're at all interested in those games or in game design and uh, game narrative uh, strategies in general. A lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Mr. George Zeitz. Well, see, we talked a little bit about this already, about why uh, Mask of the Betrayer is set in Rashomon and Thay, uh, rather than the Sword Coast. And uh, I wanted to follow this line of thought a little bit more. Uh, so you, you're talking about how you like to feel like you're exploring a, a completely new world alongside the player or the reader. And you had immersed mm -hmm. yourself in Slavic, Japanese, animistic mythologies. <laughs> the basic ingredients of uh, Mask of the Betrayer began to take shape. I'd never have been able to craft the story of Mask if I had stayed in the Sword Coast. Creativity mm -hmm. requires fresh ammunition. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Um, when I have worked on licenses that um, were very well trodden, so for example, Lord of the Rings Online, very, very well trodden um, license. I mean, that's Heck, that's the source of the yeah. source. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably the most trodden. <laughs> there's, there's just not a lot of new stuff you could do there, and and I know there are people. Maybe it's just, you know, it's just my brand of creativity. There are people who can be very creative in sort of that well-trodden space. Um, I just, I it just doesn't work for me. Like, I need new stuff. I need to s explore some new mythology or learn something completely new. Like that is when the ideas really start rolling for me. Like, I'm you know, reading about animism or reading about Japanese mythology, like stuff I don't know that well. I'm like, oh, what if you did this with it? Like, you're sort of bringing you're bringing all these ingredients that are in yourself to a new, a new area. And it's like that, like fresh combinations is what creativity is all about. Um, so taking like all of my influences throughout my life and applying them to Japanese mythology, which is not really part of my influences. Like that's where all the interesting combinations can come. If you take my influences and stick it on Lord of the Rings, like half of my influences are from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to get anything new from that. Um, so it's that newness. It's like that, at, at least for me, it's like that doing original stuff and, and exploring new ideas. Like that's where creativity comes from, uh, but everybody's different. You know, one thing that I think about, you know, on this topic is I think there's things that are fun for a writer and maybe, or maybe not, you know, I'll get your, your input on this. Is that also fun for the reader? Cause I know a lot of players, you know, cause I know a lot of people, they just want the standard fare. <laughs> you know, if you gave him a choice, well, we could do this game in the Sword Coast, or we could do it in in Rashomon. You know, this place you're not you're less familiar with. You know, I'm guessing there's a certain percentage that would say Sword Coast. I so I've had that debate with people. I'm actually yeah. not sure if that's true. So I think people. I think there has to be a mix of the familiar and the unfamiliar. Like I think people who or just giving somebody something that is completely familiar. I actually, people may say they want that. I actually don't think they do. Like, I think that's pretty boring. Mm -hmm. um, but if you take somebody, on the other hand, to something that's like 100% unfamiliar and crazy, it's like, I don't even know where to begin here. Like, that's not good either. You sort of have to have that mix, right? Where people are intrigued and there's some mysteries and there's things mm -hmm. that they haven't seen before. But then there's also things that, okay, yeah, I get this, right? You kind of have to have that initial, I get this. But here's an interesting twist. Um, and I think that is where the really interesting stuff comes from. Like, I think that's, uh, you know, you look at Stranger Things or like all mm -hmm. the things that are very popular, right? Not just the stuff that's kind of like a base hit, but like the home runs, usually there's some mix of the familiar and the unfamiliar. And they're not too much of either one. Um, and like, I think that is where you should aim for. It's certainly what I aim for on Mask. Um, and it's what I like to aim for on everything. But, you know, you, you don't always have the luxury to do that. Well, so we talked about some of the features that were dropped from Neverwinter Nights 2, the stronghold, uh, the full suite of companions, but I was not aware that Kalen, the dove, was on the chopping block at one point, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, what, and what the hell? So Kalen is my favorite 
Yeah. My favorite companion. Um, and Kalen existed before Mask of the Betrayer existed, at least in my brain. Um, there were like a whole bunch of, in those months before, you know, I started, we started working on, on, uh, Mask of the Betrayer. Um, there were like, I was sitting in the rule books and, and the source books and kind of going through and like, what would I want to have in this expansion? Oh, well, all the faithless. That sounds great. Oh, uh, and I'd come up with the, the menagerie, like Kaylin and her, and her brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. I had no idea how I was going to use them. I was just like, I really like these characters. And then we sort of threw everything together and like half of, half of the story for mask was like, I have all these disparate elements that I love. Like, how am I going to fit all this stuff together? It was like a puzzle weaving kind of exercise. Um, and yes, yeah, so Kaylin, even though she was important to a particular element of the story, in theory, you could have made mask of the betrayer without her. Um, and when we were, um, when we were coming up or when we were producing the story or starting to put everything together, um, we were over budget uh, and, and we were being a bit over ambitious and we were like, how are we going to get these characters written? Where could we potentially cut? And Kaylin was one that was like, we could, if we absolutely had to, we could cut her. Um, and then Chris Avalon came along. He's like, I love this story. This looks great. I want to write Kaylin. We said, like, yes, Chris, <laughs> thank you. Um, so he wrote Kaylin and he wrote Gan too. Um, so if, if it hadn't been for him, coming in and like to the rescue kaylin would have been would have been gone there's there's a reason why everybody loves chris avalon so much you know <laughs> yeah i mean he's i've heard so, so many stories great... like that about him he's like this uh this guardian angel or something of uh crpgs well the, the the great thing about chris is like he's been doing this for 20 some years and he hasn't lost his passion right like mm-hmm. he's still super excited oh, yeah. he's like oh i love that i really want to write that so many designers have really like you go in this business for 15, 20 years, a lot of people kind of lose their steam. Chris hasn't. And I think like that's one of the big differences between him and, and a lot of other people. All right. So now I've got another big topic here, game design, uh, that we that I wanted to spend some time on. Uh, namely, heroes and villains and, and good and evil. Okay. You know, this is something I've talked about quite a bit off and on. What you're talking here about choices in the real world can almost never be reduced to just good versus evil, you know, mm-hmm. black and white. You know, we obviously see that, and yet a lot of games it kind of kind of seems like that. Uh, so you say that you want your goal was to give all the major characters, both the villains and the heroes, believable motivations, mm-hmm. and that was because you wanted the players to get drawn into the story emotionally, sympathizing with some NPCs and not hating others, and. Now you you say that a lot of uh, a lot of other games the evil PCs just end up as second class citizens. Mm-hmm. So there's there's quite a bit to unpack here. <laughs> yeah, you know, we got you know I like the idea. It's not just the villains you want to have uh, motivations for, but also the lack of a better word, good guys. Mm-hmm. You know, as well, mm-hmm. making both of those more nuanced. So. Everyone in when I've when I've worked on stories, I want everyone to feel like a believable character. Um, nobody in real life thinks they're a villain. Most people don't even think they're a hero. Um, I always try to ground every character in like you know they think of themselves as the heroes of their own story. Mm-hmm. They're doing all these things for a really good reason, and uh, most people aren't doing it just because they're psychotic. I'm um, evil. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, how many people do you know in real life who are like, who actually believe they are evil? Like, even evil people don't believe that they are evil. Mm-hmm. Um, so, giving everybody that dimensionality and making them feel like real humans, like that, makes the players' choices so much more challenging, which is great because that's that's a fun choice. Um. Same thing for the player. Like it, it always drives me nuts. Where, unless you're doing a really cartoony, like goofy game, um, picking like like if you've got uh, a, a set of options and and the options are like yes, I agree with you, or mm, no, that doesn't sound good, or I am going to kill you. Like <laughs> how, how often does that really happen? Right? Like does that make any sense at all? Um, it just feels so cartoony and so artificial, and it, it just knocks me right out of the world. Um, so. I like to give players, like if you're going to give players an evil path, make it something compelling, right? Make it something that you can really get your head around. Um, and it's something you feel cool doing, right? Like I am manipulative. Haha. I am like manipulating people to my own ends. Like that feels yeah. realistic. 
right? The psychotic thing where I just walk up to some random dude and like slit their throat. Like, ah, it's just not interesting. Yeah, I think that's the genius of this when you can get it to where somebody's playing it and feeling like, well, I'm making the right decisions. I'm being good. And then only later realizes, oh, my God, I've been evil this whole time. You know, What a monster I am. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. get it. You know, it's yeah, I'm with you on the <laughs> third option, but I will kill you because I am yep. evil. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't really Yeah, there's, there's so much of that, too. It's like the multiple choice test for when I'm obviously the wrong answer. And they just put it on there. <laughs> yeah. But it must be tricky to, to bake this or to deal with this when there's you got the morality system that you're sort of forced to work with, right? It's baked into the system. The, uh, you'd mentioned the light side, dark side. Mm. Uh, I think a lot about the alignments in D&D. And so how much flexibility do you have to implement a system like you're talking about? It, well, again, it, it depends on it depends on the uh, on the license. Like on Mask of the Betrayer, uh, we at least had um, the D and D alignment system where you had the good and the evil, but you've also got the law and the chaos. So you have a few different dimensions you can play around with, and you can also interpret those in, in a variety of ways. Uh, especially nowadays, like D and D is moving away from alignments uh, to some extent, uh, but they're also getting more nuanced in their interpretations of alignment. Mm -hmm. So the D and D system in particular is getting easier to work with uh, if you're trying to do something more interesting. Um, yeah, light side, dark side, that's tough. Uh, I don't, I don't envy people working in the star Wars universe and trying to make interesting nuanced choices. Um, but you know, a lot of games nowadays are all, also just not having a morality system. Um, you know, like in, uh, pillars of eternity, Josh Sawyer had the, uh, he had those reputations mm -hmm. where it wasn't so much like, um, it wasn't like a line, good, evil. It was more like you could be gaining points as a diplomat or you have a reputation of being uh whatever uh cruel or like there's a lot of different potential um a lot of different potential ways like reputations that you can gain by picking different things and doing different things um so that's that is a more nuanced and interesting system or you could just do away with uh a, with a morality system entirely uh, and just players are doing stuff and there's consequences for it um, which, uh, you know, is essentially like what we did in Wasteland, um, where there isn't really a morality system. It's just there are choices and there are consequences and that's all there is to it. Um, so and that, and that can work. Like players don't need a morality system. Um, you know, it's just, just as long as the things that they do have impacts, I think that's enough. Mm -hmm. And kind of related to this, I, I'm wondering just as a writer, uh, you want to give players these really meaningful choices, and have the consequences, but is there a sort of is there a point where it just gets to be so stressful and frustrating for a player to have to make these tough choices that it's you know what I'm trying to say there it's like it's it's like it's not fun you know to have to make these really tough choices all the time well um again it it depends on the audience that you're going for if you're if you're making a hack and slasher then you know you know they're they're not gonna want to be making moral choices every twenty minutes um I think there is, I mean, you have to balance it, um, but I think there is an audience out there. Like if you, um, if you're playing to the RPG crowd, um, you know, having impactful choices every so often, like we did in mask where then you're seeing a lot of different, a lot of different repercussions of it. Um, if you're making huge impactful choices in every dialogue, yes, that's too much. Um, but I think, you know, there, there's ways to find a balance. And I think most people, you know, most people like expressing themselves, right? There's a reason that like quizzes on Facebook are so popular, like asking people to be like, hey, what do you think of this? Or what kind of person are you? Like people love doing that. Um, and I think that's sort of part of what's at the root of why these choice and consequence games work. That's yeah, so George, I understand you're not a fan. I'm not either of this uh, save the world style plots i mean we've seen this it saved the town then it saved the planet and saved the cosmos and <laughs> uh you say it's not a very good backdrop uh you prefer a more personal storyline so it sounds like you want to elaborate on that a little bit yeah so i mean one of the things is you know if you drop a player into a fantasy world or a science fiction world they don't really care about that world <laughs> like if you you have no connection to it, you really don't know much of anything about it. If you're told, oh, my God, the universe is at risk, like, ah, who cares? You know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. But, but when a player first drops into a world, um, what do they care about? What can you be certain they care about is themselves, right? I mean, that's like that's the, the very first thing and the only thing that initially you're going to care about. As time goes on and you're adventuring in that world, you may also come to care about 
characters, right? Like just like in real life, you spend time with people, you spend time with companions, you start to care about them too. So plots that involve threats to companions that you care about, that can work too. Um, threats to gameplay, like if you have, um, uh, you know, if you if you have some abilities that you're relying on throughout the game, and then a villain takes it away from you, like that's going to piss you off, and you're going to hate that villain because they did that. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, caring about this sort of nebulous fantasy world number six hundred and twenty-three <laughs> that, like, I, I don't even know exactly what kingdom of such and such. I don't remember the names. Like, it's just very hard to care about that. Um, and it always surprises me how it is assumed that a game is going to be more compelling or a story mm-hmm. is going to be compelling if there is this threat to the world. Um, one thing that I remember, uh, so Planescape Torment still probably my favorite story in, in an RPG of all time. But um, one thing I, I, I almost, I don't know if this is true or not, but I almost felt like the hand of a marketing person in there somewhere um, where there is a couple points in that game where, um, you're doing this very personal story and then there's like, oh, and by the way, uh, because the nameless one is being reborn again and again, it's threatening the entire multiverse, <laughs> like the coherence of the multiverse. And they drop that in there like maybe three or four times. I was always like, y- you don't even need that. Like, it's yeah. such a great story. Like, just forget that. Dump it. And it's a great story even without it. Like, I, I n- never understood why, like, people feel like that's needed when yeah. you... It's not like you the player's much- sitting there, I don't care about this story, but now that I know that the right. fabric of the universe is, is, is at stake, now I suddenly care. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's just it's just kind of goofy. Um, yeah. Just tell a great story about the player. I think I feel like we need to engrave this somewhere, because it just seems to be the, the go-to just about every game. Every executive conference room is where it needs to be engraved. We've got to raise that's, the that's, stakes. <laughs> yeah, and every marketing classroom in throughout the world that uh, that might send people to the game industry. All right, so let's move on. Well, let's see. Let me <laughs> preface this a little bit. I wanted to ask a few things. Well, one thing, actually, about Dungeon Siege 3. That's to just set you up. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, no problem. And you don't you don't mind talking about it, right? I don't absolutely don't mind talking about anything. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so after becoming this rock star uh, with Mask of the Betrayer, uh, somewhere around in there, you started working on Dungeon Siege Three. Uh, this game came out in 2011, and as I was reading about it, it seemed like you really poured your heart into this game. I mean, uh, I saw that you had created a 100-page source book to expand that universe. I mean, that must have taken a lot of work and. Uh, when it came out, you know, I don't know how many people watching this will remember that, but the uh, reviews were, I would say, kind of lukewarm. I didn't see that's anybody. A, that's, a, that's a kind way of putting well, it. Well, I didn't see too many that were just tearing it apart, <laughs> but it wasn't anything to do with uh, with you. It was just like the voice acting and the, the PC port uh, had some issues and things of that sort. Uh, but you had said that you didn't agree with that. You thought the problem was that the or you were getting basically forced... Uh, to follow these uh, narrative goals and constraints uh, that were being imposed on you, and you're, you're trying to push back on those. So I was just wondering, what what, what were those? So Dungeon Seed 3 was a was a strange project in a lot of ways. Um, just to give to kind of go back even further, I had actually left Obsidian after Mask of the Betrayer. I had gone to Bethesda for a little while um, to work on Elder Scrolls Online. Um, and then uh, the guys at Obsidian told me that they were working on, they were going to be making... Here, Go with, here's Baldur's Gate comes back into the story. Um, they were making Baldur's Gate 3. Um, and I had the opportunity to be the narrative lead on Baldur's Gate 3. So I left Bethesda. I went back across the country uh, with the assumption that we were going to be making Baldur's Gate 3. It turned out we're not making Baldur's Gate 3. We're making Dungeon Siege 3. Oh, <laughs> the, old the old bait and switch. The old bait and switch. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. they didn't mean to do that. Oh. It was because the, the contract talks fell through. Um, I, they really wanted to make Baldur's Gate 3. But um, Dungeon C3 was a weird project. So Obsidian, the people at uh, the people at Obsidian knew really well how to make the classic Obsidian RPG, right? Mm-hmm. The real-time with pause, the turn-based, um, that Baldur's Gate 3 style, like, that would have been a really good fit for Obsidian. Uh, but because of the realities of, you know, we, we need to survive, and this is what the publisher's offering us, um, they, they, took, they, they took on this action RPG instead. Not a lot of people at Obsidian knew how to make an action RPG. Mm -hmm. We hadn't done it before. Um, And there was this vision at the beginning of make an action RPG, like take 
fast action, multiplayer combat, action RPG, and mix it with deep choices and consequences, story, obsidian RPG. And those two things just really didn't go together very well. Um, and we discovered that as we went along. is like, you know, the guys who want to go and hack and slash things, multiplayer, like, they don't want to sit through a long dialogue and have choices and consequences like we were talking about earlier. Uh, and similarly, like, a lot of the choice and consequence narrative people don't really love the action RPG style. So it was a very strange... We, we tried for a very long time to reconcile that. Um, and what ultimately ended up happening was um, we, we ended up kind of dialing back the narrative a lot. Um, it was like Dungeon Siege games, you know, were much simpler narratives. Um, and we sort of simplified and simplified and genericized. And, you know, uh, there were decisions made that, like, it, again, actually it goes back to uh, has to be about saving the nation and saving the world. <laughs> and, of course, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, ah. Oh. If, um, if it was save the donkey, the, I could have gotten behind that. Though. Right? Yeah, and they didn't even save the donkey, unfortunately. Um and uh, uh, the, the the legion, who w- was which is what you were part of, like had to be objectively good. Like sort of all the go to things that I usually like onto uh, when I'm trying to make an interesting story. You know, the moral complexities and everything. Like all that stuff was sort of like not available anymore on Dungeon Siege. Um, and we just dialed back the narrative to a point where, to our traditional audience, it just wasn't particularly interesting anymore. Um, there were a few elements in there, here and there, that I think were pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Um, we did have actually a villain who was very, very shades of gray, um, which, which I think is probably one of the better things in that game. Um, but yeah, it was just a very strange project for Obsidian on all levels, not just on narrative. Um, and and we didn't end up with something that I think made like we didn't really please the Dungeon Siege fans, and we also didn't please the Obsidian fans. Oh. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, so it just not. Not one of Obsidian's best projects. We did learn, I th- we talked about this already a little bit, but we did kind of learn how to make a story and a game and uh, gameplay for that genre um, like once we were done and we had a really good expansion. But Yeah, that expansion turned out much better. It did, yeah, that was a much better. We had a, a neat choice in it and it was, it was pretty good. So all you folks that didn't like Dungeon Siege 3, uh, check out the expansion. Yeah, Treasures of the, Treasures of the Sun, I believe. It was a good expansion. All right, so this brings us up to about 2015, by my reckoning, and uh, we've got Pillars of Eternity. I guess it was, what was it? I'm trying to remember what they called it original. Project Eternity, I think. Maybe. Project Eternity. Project Eternity. Yep. Yep. So that's a huge moment for all of us who love the, you know, this style of game, Infinity Engine games, you know, you name it. I was reading somewhere about you and Eric Finster, maker, who's uh, come up already. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, you guys pitched a storyline for uh, Pillars of Eternity. But somehow so it even, didn't end up working on. I'm kind of like, what what happened there? What was? It was it was even more complicated than that. Um, so <laughs> uh, so a tangled web. Yeah, it was it was a tangled web. So um, Powers of Eternity, the 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 approach to the story that they decided to take um, was different from any Obsidian game up to that point. Uh, I was actually off site at that point because I wasn't even working at Obsidian anymore. Uh, but I had been brought in for the Kickstarter, mm-hmm. so. Um, what they want, I don't, I don't actually know where this came from, but what they wanted to do was have all of the sort of narrative type people pitch a story. So Chris Avalon pitched the story, Josh pitched the story, me, um, Eric, Bobby Null, a whole bunch of people. Um, and then once we had pitched all the stories, we were going to choose which one like was the strongest. And then that was the one we would, that was the story we would make for the game. In reality, what we ended up doing was, well, we really like this ingredient from George's story, and we really like this ingredient from Eric's story, and we like this ingredient from Bobby's story. And so, like, all of them sort of got thrown together or put, well, actually, that was tasked with uh, Fenster Maker and I, was to weave all these things that everybody liked together into a single story. Um, so I was on that for a little while, and then Fenster Maker continued with it. Like a Frankenstein after. story. It, it was, it was. It was like, it, it sort of was this, like, Frankensteinian construction uh, and there was still a lot of good stuff in it but I think <clears throat> I think like one of the things was as a result of like taking a bunch of different things and kind of sticking them together I, I think some of the elements didn't work as well in the new context as they did in their original context um, so it was a it was an unusual process I, I don't think they've done that again at Obsidian like I think 
Killers 2 was mostly Josh uh, coming up with that story. Um, it was not another, like, everybody come up with a story. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to compete with the likes of you and Chris Avalon, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, again, like, Av- Avalon's, uh, Avalon's had some ideas that ended up in the story, and I had some, and... Um, I don't. I, you know, it was there was a lot of neat stuff in there, um, but it just you know when it all came together and then with some of the other things on the project, it uh, yeah it was good, but it, it wasn't as strong I think as they would have liked. All right, so let's bring this up to 2017, then we can talk about Torment Tides of Numenera. Now I imagine this was a real uh, dream for you, you know, somebody who loved Planescape Torment so much, and yeah, uh, Chris Avalon's work and. You know, you said about Planescape Torment, that was the game you would consider to be the biggest game uh, that can classify as a work of art. Yep. Uh, so this was this obviously huge for you. Can you sort of set us up a little bit for a discussion of uh, Torment then? And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, Sorry about the delay. Uh, Hopefully we'll have the next installment. There might even be two more installments, but we'll see see what the time looks like. Uh, But anyway, the next installment will be up, hopefully, uh, by next week. So thank you very much for uh, doing your part to support the show. Uh, As always, I want to thank you uh, very, 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 very much for supporting Matt Chat, for keeping these episodes in production. Could not, would not do it without you, my friend. Uh, so if you uh, are supporting the show already, thank you. Uh, for whatever reason, you've been debating it, uh, you know. <laughs> you know, hey, if it's worth your time, uh, it's worth a buck. Uh, so head on over to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Become a noble or ignoble Ratron and help uh, keep Matt Chat going. So uh, thanks to everybody uh, sharing the links, telling people about it. Uh, whatever it is you do to support the show, just know I am... <laughs> Uh, Matt Barton, appreciate it. Uh, on that note, I do have a few copies left of uh, Dungeons and Desktops, the uh, second edition, History of Computer Role-Playing Games. I've told you about this book several times. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think I got maybe three copies left here that I ordered uh, just for uh, the holidays. These are signed. They include the Matt Chat collectible coin uh as a bonus uh, so if you want those go to the link in the show notes there's the ebay uh, site set up for those about the same price as amazon may- maybe a little bit more uh, to compensate for ebay's uh, fees you know they really kind of stung me uh with that so also by the way i'm looking for a better way to do this uh, i like the ebay global partners or global shipping partners option main reason i go with them uh, but the fees are kind of getting out of hand. So if you know a better solution to that, please uh, share it with me. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I don't want to necessarily fund eBay. I just want to sell my books. So uh, Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Key? All right, a couple items here. One is if you want to pick up a copy of Dungeon Siege 3, this is serendipity, because uh, it's up on Humble Bundle right now for the really low price of $2.99, you know, just 3 bucks. Uh, plus, it's a Humble Bundle, so I think there's uh, some uh, kind of charitable donations that go along with that. Uh, anyway, it's only got two days left, so I don't know when you'll be watching this video. Uh, so kudos if you're one of the early birds who <laughs> watch the show. You know, some people like watch the show the, the minute I upload it. They're there. I don't know how they how they do it. It's uh, amazing to me. Uh, but anyway, if you're within the next two days, you can pick this up three bucks. I don't think it's necessarily all that expensive uh, normally, but I wanted to show you that. Uh, now, a couple other news items. I don't know what to make of this. To tell you the truth, I'm a little skeptical, but I just thought I would share it with you. There's a new Dungeons and Dragons anthology out. It's called Eat the Rich. Uh, so get a load of this. It explores real-world economic issues. Christian Hoffer over at comicbook.com was writing about this anthology. He's a, He really approves of it, seems like. Uh, anyway, 20 different adventures that feature explicitly anti-capitalist themes. Now wait for it, it's on sale <laughs> for $19.95, okay, uh, so it's not freely available. But anyway, it's at Dungeon Master's Guild, you go pick it up, and uh, you can read uh, Christopher's 
or Christian's uh, rather, his uh, take on it. You know, he says, while a lot of people do just simply enjoy slaying dragons, uh, other people look to D&D as an avenue to explore real world issues ranging from climate change to class inequality. So I don't know about you, I play precisely to escape that kind of stuff, but uh, you know, I'd like to hear you. If you got other thoughts, different position, different attitude about it, I'd love to read that, so share it in the comments. Uh, some other news. Uh, this is, I think, just frankly uh, amazing. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, Black Dawn Rebirth. This is double-sided games. If you like the old-school dungeon crawlers, I mean, this is about as old-school as it gets. It's actually a, an Amiga, a Commodore Amiga game here. It's brand new. Uh, let's see. D double-sided games have announced they've finally released the eagerly awaited dungeon crawler Black Dawn Rebirth. An Amiga game that has been teased for so long with screenshots, trailers, and a demo. I think I might have uh, mentioned it at least once before. Uh, it's got its, uh, let's see, who is it? The seventh episode of the Black Dungeon Crawler RPG series by Sean Waters, Andy Campbell, Tenzu, Tenshu, and Mike Richmond. So go check this out. It looks amazing. Uh, really uh, happy for these guys. Uh, good work. Uh, I think it's well worth it. <laughs> Especially if you like Amiga stuff, you, you don't want to miss that. Uh, and then finally, one last item here. Our friend, uh, long term, uh, long time friend of the show, uh, Matthew Weymouth, or Weymouth, sorry, uh, his Kickstarter was success successfully funded. I didn't really, it's the way the episodes uh, kind of were laid out. I didn't get to this in time. Really, I sent out some tweets and some Facebook messages uh, about this. But anyway, uh, it turned out it wasn't necessary because his game, per my last email, was successfully successfully funded with just seven hours left on the clock. You haven't heard of this, it's a casual party game for disgruntled office workers. From avoiding confrontation with coworkers to avoiding responsibility with the boss, per my last email lets you say what you really mean using passive aggressive and not so passive aggressive comments. So he's trying to raise a 14K for that and ended up with 14.3K. So congratulations, uh, Matthew. Uh, really happy for you and looking forward to seeing the game. All right, so I think that will do it for the news. Let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking for quotes about villains you know, because we talked about, you know, what makes a good villain. And I think this quotation I'm about to read to you just really, I mean, it's just, it's just so good. And it's by uh, none other than Alfred Hitchcock, who knows a few things about villains, I would, I would say. Anyway, it goes something like this. The more successful the villain, the more successful the picture. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. I did feel something. I could almost see the remote. That's good. You've taken your first step into a larger world.